Hi guys, uh, welcome to my live. I decided to uh, go live today. It's a beautiful day in Chicago where I'm at and decided to go live because so many of my patients, you know, are having questions about saturated fat and things like lard and beef tallow. And I thought it would be uh, a good idea to just share some of my thoughts about these uh, saturated fats, because so many people are afraid of saturated fat. And I think that most of the fear of saturated fat is unfounded. And uh, no matter what dietary pattern you decide to take, I think it's important that you have the facts and, and understand the history of why there's so much fear of saturated fat. So we're going to talk about that topic today. And I appreciate you guys for joining me, no matter where you're located, maybe in the chat, you can share where you're located today. And we're going to talk about saturated fat today. And I'm really excited about that because hopefully I'll be able to share this video with my patients. And of course, you can share this video with friends and family as you share the topic of saturated fat with them. So we'll, we'll start with uh, just the basics, which is what the heck is saturated fat? Uh, and basically, it's the type of fats that you think about, like that bacon grease, right, that becomes solid at room temperature. And uh, that will distinguish it from unsaturated fats, which tend to be liquid, like those vegetable oils that we're so accustomed to uh, having on our counter. And um, so, and the other part is how the structures are made. You can see the structures to the right. And with the saturated fat, you don't have those uh, double bonds that you can see are present with the um, with the saturated fat right in this area right there. So that's kind of uh, giving you a sense of that. And here's a better illustration of the double bonds that you can see right here at the bottom for the unsaturated fat. So, so I just want you to get that as kind of a foundation to understand what we're talking about. And it's also important to think about the foods and, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm more of a carnivore, so I love fatty meat and butter, things like cheese and, and dairy. And, uh, and, and you also need to know that coconut oil and chocolate are in that saturated fat category. And then you have unsaturated fats, which have always been perceived as the healthier versions in fish, avocado, the various plant oils, uh, the ones we want to stay away from are those, those seed oils peanut butter, nuts, and seeds. So that gives you a sense of that. And of course, here are, uh, you know, some saturated fat foods, the creams, the milks, the butters, the meats, they're all uh, going to contain a substantial amount of saturated fat. So when you think about the dietary guidelines, they, um, they, they say they provide science-based advice. And that's something I would question if it's really the best science, it's probably not. And it's really designed to say, well, what's the best diet for everybody, right? And they feel that if you don't follow the dietary guidelines that your health may suffer. Um, I'm not sure that's actually accurate. But at the end of the day, uh, there are a lot of people suffering from uh, obesity and other chronic diseases. So it would be nice if we had a way to guide people to a diet that was best for them. Unfortunately, historically, we've not done a great job with that. And that's why this video is being made to help you understand why that's true. And as you could imagine, most of us are familiar with lard because that bacon grease I mentioned earlier is what lard is, where, where beef uh, tallow, the tallow is from beef. And then there's other types of animal-based um, you know, fats. But so many of us are familiar with the lard. And unfortunately... That was replaced, you know, many years ago by Crisco for a while because it was thought to be, as you can see on the label, less saturated fat than butter. So it was actually celebrating the fact that it had less celebrated fat. And this particular version of Crisco, uh, they said it didn't have a lot of trans fat. In fact, they're saying zero per serving of trans fats. But what they were able to do with that definition, even though they cut the trans fats uh, down substantially, uh, there was still trans fats in Crisco. It was just not at the level that they felt was harmful, which again, I disagree with that, but 
uh, just just a kind of a historical perspective. And so why would uh, Crisco be a bad option? Well, because of the trans fats. We know that's harmful. Trans fats are difficult for your body to break down, so they tend to clog arteries fairly uh, regularly. Um, then, you know, unlike uh, butter, you know, you're not, you know, it has all these artificial things in it and it doesn't have the uh, vitamins that are very helpful in things like butter. So, uh, so it's really important, even as we talk about this topic that we think about, well, what are, what are the like real foods, right? So if it was processed, uh, imagine taking cotton seeds and turning it into Crisco. So who decided that was a good idea, right? To take cotton seeds, which is not even a food, and turn it into a product that we then allow humans to ingest. So that should have been a, a no-go from the very beginning. But I just want to provide a little historical context. And this is not to demonize Procter & Gamble, but to just remind you that in 1911, when Crisco was um, produced, Procter & Gamble did align with the American Heart Association because they, they needed the money and they decided to give them $1.7 million. And, and because of that relationship, and I'm not even sure the American Heart Association knew that Crisco was bad for you, but, but because of that relationship, they promoted Crisco. They endorsed Crisco. They put their stamp of approval on Crisco. So I want you to pause for a moment and realize that although we have to have organizations to help guide us, we always question things, right? And when you question things, you may find the hidden dangers, the things that may cause harm down the road. So whenever you see this uh, association stamp, don't just assume that that's going to be good for you because there's bias. And if someone wrote me a big check and they're still getting big checks, that may bias me. That doesn't make them bad. I think the people who work for the organization are great. I know some of those people, but you just want to question things as I would want you to question me as well. So in 1977, the United States Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs published the Dietary Goals for the United States. It was called the McGovern Report. I'm sure you've heard the McGovern Report, but now you kind of better understand what it reflects. And goal number seven was to reduce saturated fat consumption to account for no more than 10% of total intake. This led to the uh, establishment of the USDA HHS policy, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans that were published in 1980. And for every five years since, they make recommendations that pretty much align with this ideal of keeping the saturated fat low. Now, the idea that saturated fats cause heart disease, caught, you know, called the diet heart hypothesis, was introduced in the 1950s, but it was based on weak associational evidence. In other words, there are different types of evidence, different levels of quality of evidence, and when you make assertions based on, you know, survey studies or looking at data and you don't do real research, it doesn't really show a conclusion. So a lot of the conclusions that were made back then were based on poor research, which has gotten us into this trouble. And when you look at this, um, you know, illustration, it shows you the difference between a true experiment, which is what our clinical decisions and your decisions should be based on, and observational studies uh, to the right. And if we get to the level of randomized controlled trials, you can see at the bottom to the left, that's the level of evidence that we'd like to have if present. And so I never fought people for having evidence that's not randomized if they don't have that evidence yet, because you do need to start somewhere. You start with my studies, you start with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, anecdotal reports from doctors, uh, you start from case reports and things like that, and then you move on to from observational data to uh, experimental data. So let's look at, uh, you know, a little bit of a history of the uh, saturated fat story. If you look at this uh, article that I kind of reference, it has Nina Teichel's. If you've not read her book, The Big, Big Fat Surprise, you should check it out. I did interview her on a previous episode of the Protecting Your Nest podcast. She's a phenomenal uh, person. I think she'll be at uh, the Symposium for Metabolic Health next month. I'll be speaking there as well. Uh, just a phenomenal individual. A journalist is what we needed to help us identify 
the things that weren't right. So here's um, um, a very well-known uh, figure, Ansel Keys, and he hypothesized that a low-fat diet would be protective against heart disease. Um, here are the seven countries that were in his seven country study, the US, Finland, Yugoslavia, Netherlands, Italy, Greece, and Japan. And as you can see, uh, with the, the bottom uh, being, uh, you know, you're moving from left to right, that's more saturated fat in your diet. And then you'll see deaths per 1,000 to the left. And ultimately, uh, you'll see with Japan, they have a low saturated fat diet, low deaths. And, and he proved that as you move to the right, there was a higher death rate with the U.S. unfortunately being at the top of that curve. So based on that hypothesis, I would have uh, agreed with him if his study was done well, that that is absolutely true. What wasn't true, however, is that the number of countries that was in his study was much larger. And it actually included, if you look to the right, many other countries. And if you, if we were to kind of glance at what countries we're talking about, you'll see Mexico here at number 14. So they have a, a pretty decent amount of fat, yet they're not having any heart disease. Um, you look at uh, country number eight, which looks like France, and you may have heard of the French paradox, right? So how is it that in France, people eat high fat, and yet they don't have a lot of heart disease? Well, we can see from this data point that they absolutely have um, a low incidence of uh, heart disease, but they eat a lot of saturated fat, and then you have some others like number 17 appears to be Norway uh, and 15 is Holland. Again, high in saturated fat, but not up here high with the United States for death. So, so you can see that if he had published the information properly, you would have seen a discrepancy and there wouldn't have been um, a, a correlation as you see from the left graph. So I remember when I was uh, uh, trying to educate patients years ago, about my concern about saturated fat when I was a vegetarian. I would always uh, I think Dr. McGregor um, uh, uh, was one of the doctors that would talk about, you know, what a test tube would look like. And uh, this is an example of somebody who ate a donut and what their blood looked like after you checked it. So that would make you pause if you saw that. But I now understand that it's not exactly what you think. And, and when you eat a diet high in saturated fat, you actually use saturated fat as fuel, and it actually clogs your arteries less than this tube would suggest. So let's look at uh, another study that is an example of an observational study. And again, this is a type of study. This is called the PURE study, and it's looking at the associations of fat and carbohydrate on heart disease and mortality. So uh, prospective versus retrospective, looking uh, forward versus looking backwards, but it's looking at data. And again, data is not real research, but, but for purposes of this conversation, I want you to at least get a feel for what that type of study looks like. So here's the background, as I've suggested. Let's look at these macronutrients, you know, fats and carbs. Do they affect your mortality uh, or your risk for heart disease based on how much you're consuming? Uh, this PURE study involved a lot of people, 135,335 individuals. But as you can see, they used food frequency questionnaires. Someone literally sent these folks questionnaires and they answered the questions asking them, what did you eat uh, last week, last month, and last year? And that type of guesswork makes these types of study not as uh, uh, causative in terms of the data they create. What was the interpretation? High carb intake was associated with a higher risk of total mortality, whereas uh, total fat and individual types of fat were related to lower total mortality. Now, you would think I would, you know, jump up and say, hey, I told you so, right? But again, this is a, a correlative, associative study. It's not cause and effect. So although this aligns with my belief systems, we must always be honest about the sub, you know, the types of study we're looking at. So let's look at this study, slightly better quality, uh, low fat dietary pattern and weight change over seven years. Many of you have heard of the Women's Health Initiative Dietary Modification Trial, very uh, popular study to quote 
And this study looked at obesity in the United States and uh, rather or not, you know, your, your weight, uh, it was impacted by, uh, you know, dietary patterns uh, like low carb or high carb diets, et cetera, low fat. So it looked at that and it had a lot of people, 48,835 uh, were involved, but they were randomized uh, to uh, an intervention versus a control. So that's a little bit better, right? Because you're now doing what sounds like more research-based studies where the other types of studies uh, we just quoted did not do that. And what they found in this study is that a low-fat eating pattern does not result in weight gain. So if you reduce fat, saturated fat being one of them, uh, that does not seem to show uh, the type of benefit. They also found in this study it didn't improve cardiovascular disease or impact the risk for cancer. So, so again, these are the types of studies that we start with when we don't have randomized controlled trials. Well, actually, this is more of a randomized trial, but the first one was not. So here's another study, uh, which I, I wanted to put in front of you, the use of dietary uh, linoleic acid for secondary prevention of coronary heart disease and death. And this is interesting in that this was a study they, they, they looked at. They had to recover the data because sometimes when the data shows outcomes that the mainstream is not interested in hearing, they'll hide the data. So someone actually hid it and they found it. And, um, and so they were trying to examine the, tr the traditional diet heart hypothesis through recovery and analysis of previously unpublished data, right? And, and as you look at it, it was uh, you know, a diet heart randomized controlled trial and system review and meta-analysis. So, um, so this double-blinded randomized trial was done uh, once they had to recover data and you know, to test rather replacement of saturated fat. So we're gonna get rid of the saturated fat that everybody's so afraid of, and we're gonna give them vegetable oils, those seed oils that are literally made from seeds that then are processed to turn into a liquid oil. And does that then reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and death? Uh, what they found um, is that the replacement of saturated fat in the diet with linoleic acid did lower serum cholesterols, but it does not support the hypothesis that this translates to a lower risk of death from coronary heart disease or all causes. So... So what that tells me is what I already knew is that your cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol are poor markers of your risk for a heart attack. A better marker would be your triglycerides and HDL, your belly fat and your blood pressure and things like that, blood sugar. Those are better markers. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that in this study, they found that you know getting rid of saturated fat did not do anything beneficial. So... When you think about those observational studies and the randomized studies that I just highlighted, you now understand why the American College of the Journal of Cardiology had to put out a, um, another statement about saturated fat. I've mentioned this in the past, but again, I have to keep mentioning it until people get the memo. And I think this was June of 2020. And um, they're saying that current evidence-based health effects of uh, saturated fatty acids depend on the interacting effects from naturally occurring food components from unhealthy compounds introduced by processing. So when you process these things, um, um, you know, it'll make it worse. But what they're saying is that when you think about whole fat dairy, unprocessed red meat, dark chocolate, those are like foods that are high in saturated fat, but they're not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease or diabetes, not. So this is a, uh, not that I trust all the large organizations, but this is a, a mainstream uh, journal, mainstream organization that has made this statement. So I think it's something you should know because I think a lot of clinicians are not aware that this is what they've decided is true. And you won't believe this, but uh, if you just search, uh, you know, College of Cardiology position statement on fat, you'll see also that they'll say that uh, saturated fat is associated with a reduced risk for stroke. 
how you like that. So not only is it not causing heart disease, but it may reduce your risk for stroke. So here are the highlights here. Um, and again, the previous recommendations to reduce uh, saturated fat to less than 10% had been the standard. Uh, they find that the foods that I just highlighted in that graph are not associated with cardiovascular disease, and there's not enough evidence to support us limiting saturated fat in our diet. So um, the idea that saturated fat causes heart disease, which was that diet heart hypothesis introduced in the 1950s, you know, again, was associational evidence. So I just wanted to put that in front of you again, because there was never really a causal link established, which is why the Journal of the American College of Cardiology reversed their position. So let's talk a little bit about uh, saturated fat. Here are various forms of saturated fat. Uh, you know, some people in the low carb community will just eat butter just straight, just out of the refrigerator. I'm not quite there yet, but but now you know what that that may not be so harmful to them, right? But one thing I want to mention about saturated fat is that it's so important for many reasons. Uh, number one is your cell membranes are made of phospholipids and the tail of which is basically saturated fat, right? So imagine the cells in your body not having that protective phospholipid bilayer there to protect the cells. If we take that away by eating diets that are low in uh, saturated fat, we may struggle uh, in a way that is, is so vast because it, 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 it's all the cells in your body. So it's just something to think about. Here's another kind of illustration, the stuff they show you in the biochemical class, right? And here's the phospholipid bilayer, and you can see it illustrated here. So uh, caprylic acid is an example of a saturated fat that you'll see in certain types of uh, things like palm, coconut uh, oils, and of course, uh, milk. Uh, so in, in, in milk of humans or so breast milk, we give our babies uh, caprylic acid and saturated fat, which is why they develop so so well when they're being given uh, breast milk. So we should not be afraid of caprylic acid. It also has other benefits like uh, helps with our blood sugar, um, destroys the yeast cell wall. So if you have anything issues with like candida, it helps. It's antibacterial, antiviral, reduces gout, uh, helps our skin to not be irritated and also uh, supports our urinary tract. But there are other types of saturated fat. Uh, uh, lauric acid is another, also found in uh, coconut and milk and oil and uh, in other types of oils that are listed here. Uh, they also benefit us because it helps with the skin with things like psoriasis, acne, uh, helps with aging so we can get less wrinkles, has anti microbial benefits, and also other skin uh, conditions like the dry skin. So, and then we have uh, palmitic acid. That's another one that you'll find in butter, meat, milk, and cheese, and palm oil. And again, this saturated fat supports our cells, which for obvious reasons you understand now, anti-inflammatory. And who, thought, who would thought that a saturated fat would lower your lipids, right? And that's because they protect your cells. And if your cells are protected, you don't have to make all those cholesterol molecules to support cells that are not protected. It supports your skin and it works to moisturize your skin. And butyric acid is the last one I wanted to highlight in yogurts, creams, uh, goats and sheep milk, et cetera, cheeses, butter, so all of that good stuff. And it also supports your brain health uh, your blood pressure, your sleep, gut, and improves your blood sugar. So it's really nice to know that all of these different types of fats are there to kind of help uh, support our body in a total way, but mainly those cells that are very helpful. Who knew that saturated fat was also important for your calcium metabolism? So I wanted to put that in front of you. We know calcium is very important for our bone structures, and I want to make sure that we're always uh, putting in our body what's going to support our bone health. And of course, that is our bones in front of us. So I just wanted to put that in front of you. You can kind of see from the previous slides that our immune system benefits from saturated fat. So all those immune uh, organs in our body are going to benefit when we have sufficient 
saturated fat and our hormones. Uh, you need uh, saturated fat just to make your, your testosterones, your estrogens, your cortisols. A lot of those kind of are involved. Our pituitary is benefited, our adrenal, thymus, thyroid, all of these uh, organs are going to benefit in terms of hormone production. So imagine a person who doesn't eat saturated fat, they're likely to have issues with their hormones, their emotions. And I, I see this all the time in my clinic, people who are not supplementing properly with the omegas and things like that, uh, they tend to struggle and uh, have an issue around emotions at times. So let's talk about the basic takeaways to walk away with. Uh, when you're thinking about food, uh, there are definitely uh, foods that when you cook them at high temperatures are going to, uh, you know, really convert to a trans fat uh, with those high temperatures. So to the degree you can, as you can see from this image, these are all fast food examples. Let's try to avoid that whenever possible. Of, of course, you may be traveling sometimes and there may be times when you'll struggle with that, but it's really important when possible to avoid these things. Now, I went to school in New Orleans. And uh, when I go to New Orleans, it's very difficult when I'm visiting to eat well. So this is an example of what I would see in New Orleans. And I'm not saying when I'm in New Orleans, I'm not going to indulge periodically. But what you saw in the previous slide should not be your standard. Your standard should be to eat a steak and not the processed foods uh, that you saw there. And just keep in mind that when you're cooking uh, foods, uh, the temperature matters. And as you can see from the uh, image, the boiling point, the smoke point is when you're more likely uh, to introduce trans fats into your food. So if you can avoid uh, using oils that are not designed for those high temperatures, the avocado oil apparently is, and things like olive oil apparently aren't. So I would not deep fry you know, that, that, uh, that shrimp I just showed you, if you're cooking it in olive oil, make sure you use things like uh, avocado oil and or coconut oil are, are better options. You're not using butter and olive oil for those types of temperatures. I, I have a link uh, tree, as you know, in my uh, notes to the video. And in my link tree, you have my handout. This is the side to have more foods like and then the opposite side of this handout are the foods to avoid. Just wanted to highlight the fats again that I tend to encourage. And, and, and these are the ones like that ghee that's kind of towards the uh, near the bottom. That, that's clarified butter. And that's an example of a butter that because it was clarified, it's actually able to handle higher temperatures. Uh, I think animal fats being at the top should be highlighted. And I mentioned... Uh, with the thumbnail that I'm okay with lard, right? So cooking your food with lard uh, from a pig or beef tallow is totally okay. And, and those types of fats are shelf sta stable. They're also stable in terms of dealing with uh, your cooking. And you may do well to keep those in mind when you're thinking about cooking. And so the main thing I want to kind of have you walk away with today is I mentioned earlier that the, the thing that's important to determine your risk for your health is not the cholesterol or the LDL. It's really your metabolic markers. So here are your metabolic markers. These are the things you really want to ask your clinician to look at. And if you can get all of those in the normal range, your risk of getting chronic medical conditions like hypertension, diabetes, uh, dementia, cancer, and others are going to be greatly reduced. So I would really focus on that. Your waist circumference is probably the one that's going to yield the greatest results. And, um, you know, improving your metabolic health is actually not hard. Uh, it's really about the water. It's about movement. It's about, you know, getting uh, some muscle. Muscle is very important. Uh, eating protein. Uh, I'll probably be eating uh, some protein when I finish recording. Um, and green tea has been known for those who like that to reduce your risk for cancer and has other effects that are just amazing. Uh, low carb is obviously a great way to achieve metabolic health. Get enough sleep, avoiding toxins like smoking, 
uh, and all those preservatives, which is why it's important to eat at home. And if you need to supplement, feel free to do that as well with amino acids. I put this last slide in here on purpose to, you know, celebrate uh, what I have on my face. So whenever I am um, putting a, a moisturizer on my face, guess what I use? I use lard. So this company, Farrow, which is one of my, uh, in my link tree, it's one of my affiliates. So if you want to support the channel, feel free to do that. But but this is an example, just a little dab on my face actually helps to moisturize my skin. And I tell you, it's been uh, an amazing product and something to consider. So, so with that, we will stop sharing the slides and I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen and, and, and just take a look at the chat. Uh, we got some folk, um, looks like uh, a thank you from Jay and I appreciate you, Jay, for you know, taking a moment to be on the, the live stream today. And uh, we got some folk in Dallas, uh, love Dallas and appreciate uh, the warm weather there. We're getting some of that weather in Chicago as we speak. Got some folk um, in Newport News and uh, appreciate you joining in. And that's, uh, uh, Joe, I'm not even going to try it. I'm going to say Miller. All right. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Atlanta, uh, Georgia, uh, Advocate Health is now in uh, that area as well, uh, known as Atrium Health. So we're kind of, we got our legs down there. Got someone in my neck of the woods, uh, Margetta in Illinois, appreciate you joining in, and got one of our um, uh, LinkedIn users who joined us as well, and and then we have uh, uh, Sunny, who just appreciates the live stream. So so again, I'm going to keep my live stream uh, brief uh, as we kind of wrap up because we have a block party here where I live in this area. So. Uh, Marcus, I appreciate you and Flossmore, very familiar with Flossmore. And just thank all you guys for just finding some time to join me. Good uh, colleague, Sherry Johnson, one of my work buddies. She helps to lead uh, my health center and she's always uh, supportive. So shout out to you and to everybody for just taking the time to join me tonight. I hope that information was helpful. You're definitely going to find clinicians. You're going to find patients uh, friends and family who are very concerned about saturated fat. And I just hope that information takes away some of that uh, that fear of saturated fat. Sorry about the little light shining at me, but uh, I'm going to wrap up with that. Thank you guys. And you guys have a great evening, Susie. I appreciate you and we'll see you in the next video. And thank you for supporting the live stream. I uh, got a few comments that people really like that platform. So uh, feel free. And if you have additional questions at the end of the live stream, just put it in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. Take care, guys.